Yes. Thank you, though. Well, um, lovely to see you all, um, and I hope some more people turn up. So um, we will have to see what comes. Um, so this is, um, I don't, we used to run these as judging seminars before, but um, really they're just a bit one-sided. And to run a judge seminar properly, you need two days. So this isn't that. So this is, uh, we call it a workshop. Um, and uh, about half of it, or maybe a bit more than half, is going to be about judging and arrestee and figures and all those things. Um, and then we're going to switch and talk about um, pilot stuff because, of course, um, it's all very well teaching judges exactly how to judge this stuff. But what we want is people in airplanes flying and um, making figures and shapes in the sky that judges want to see. So um, we'll start off. And um, so welcome. I think I've already said. Um, this is a free discussion. So if you want to ask a question, just jump in and ask. Um, there's a bit of a problem for Rod and I in that um, once we started to share the screen like this, we've only got little pictures of you. So um, I'm making sure that we catch you waving your um, hand or arm or whatever about is not so easy. So Rod's going to try and look out for that. We're running WhatsApp in the background um, in case he wants to tell me stuff. But please, would you, um, unless you want to say something, click the three dots um, in your little video slot, get your name correct, um, and turn the speaker off. Otherwise, when the dog barks, we're all going to disappear outside of the window. Um, and if you want to talk, uh, just put your hand up, and um, hopefully we'll see you. Uh, otherwise, it will have to be towards the end. Um, hopefully also you've downloaded a, a PDF copy of this presentation so you can go back through it. Um, I'm going to run the PowerPoint version. Um, so let's kick off. Uh, as I've already said, there, there are really two groups of people at competitions that are very important. One, of course, is the pilots. We only go there uh, so that we can watch people flying aerobatics. But the other group of people is um, a little group of judges. At internationals, that group of judges on the judging line can grow to about 25 people, and it's quite a crowd. So um, if you're a judge, um, particularly if you're aiming at getting away from this country and doing a bit of wider judging on the international scene, you'll find that you're joining quite a throng of people. A bit smaller in this country, but um, there we go. It's all the same sort of thing. So um, pilots, you really need to know what the judges are looking for you to do, because if you do stuff that they um, don't like or that gives them questions to work out, you're not going to get the marks you want. Um, and for judges, of course, you, have, you must have a, a pretty clear understanding of the principles of judging. And um, I've said here it's not difficult. In fact, there's an awful lot to learn. Um, but you need to know enough of it to be able to make snap decisions because it all keeps carrying on at a great rate of knots. All right, so um, judging and judging. Um, this lovely picture is from a few years back at Duxford down the road. Um, we had a, a fairly major competition. The most important things for a judge are obviously the ability to deduct marks um, and to do it accurately and quickly whilst you're watching a sequence. Um, it's basically, um, and in principle, it's quite simple, but um, it's like when you start to learn to fly, the airplane keeps on going and you can't stop and think. So you do need to get your wits about you and, and go at a good rate of knots. You need a good knowledge of the rules um, or um, an ability to pick things up very quickly um, after you watch them. You need good eyesight. I'm afraid you can't do it if your eyesight isn't too good. And the thing that most people don't realise from the start is that it's a teamwork job. Um, it is almost impossible to sit on the judging line with a piece of paper in your hand and judge somebody because you can't read the paper and look at the airplane and you can't write the marks down either. So it's a bit of a team job. Um, so learn the rules, um, get a, a, a copy of the BA rules on the, the flyer that we sent around the bit on the internet. Um, we said which part of the rules you need to know. Um, it's not that many pages. And go and look at the British Aerobatic Association website because um, it's all a bit more graphic there and you can read through that in your own time. The next thing to do, if you think you can um, 
work your way through a sequence is to practice calling for another judge. Um, that all sounds very simple, um, but um, it's a bit like public speaking. Um, you either get on top of it or you find it difficult to start with, but calling for another judge will get you to understand how the sequence moves forward from start to finish, and it'll help you to understand what the judge wants to hear and what the judge is going to look for. So you have to get used to being a team member. It's a cooperative thing. When you've learned to call a bit, go and scribe. Um, that's very educational. Um, and then call. And then with a bit of luck, you'll get put in the hot seat and you'll have to judge and work out whether you can keep up with the flow. So download the rules, go read them. Um, the key parts are there. Section four in the BAA judging rules is judging rules and procedures. It's only six pages. And then section 14 is the criteria for judging the arrestee figures. It's very dry stuff to read. It's um, um, really without an aeroplane making a noise in front of you. It's quite hard to um, get mentally focused, but you need to have the right background. You need to know the rules and uh, that's the only way to do it. CIBA regulations, um, it's another huge book with over 100 pages, but you can pick the rules out of that. A um, little bit more complex because we have to explain things more clearly to international people, but very much the same. There's not much difference between the CIBA rules and our own. So judging team, um, it's a caller, a judge and a scribe. And um, the caller talks the figures through piece by piece from start to finish. Uh, and uh, the best way to do it is to say exactly what's coming just before it happens. You don't need to describe the whole figure. So for a stall turn, it's uh, pull vertical, and then the airplane goes up towards the top, and then near the top, you say stall turn, and then vertical down, and um, pull or push to level at the end. So the judge listens to the caller, um, in my experience, it's much better if the judge has no paperwork in his hands. Rely on your caller. It's a good team to, to, to get to work. Um, and the judge uh, responds to each thing that the each element that the caller calls. And um, I find it very useful to say the downgrades as they're happening, and then I can kind of mentally add them up. Um, and speaking of the downgrades helps you to understand what's going on in front of you, it helps the scribe to write it down. And then at the end of the figure, you have to give a final mark. So the scribe records each mark, um, notes the downgrade reasons, and reads back the figure number and the mark. Um, it's really quite important that to make sure things don't go wrong. Calling um, is, is quite straightforward. Um, this sort of um, part Maneuvers here um, is obviously easy, horizontals and verticals. Um, a loop is a 360 pitch movement, can be positive or negative. Um, a push half loop you see on the page with um, something like that, or the black items to the right. Uh, push half loop can be horizontal to horizontal, or vertical to vertical, or 45 to 45, um, many variations. When the airplane's in a 45 degree um, line, you're 45 degree up, um, I'm showing they're positive and 45 down negative, and you need to tell the judge which you should expect to see. The 5 eighths loop is, um, you often see in a half Cuban, and um, quite often callers call that as a three quarter, but it's not, it's a 5 eighths. Three quarters you see in the, um, um, I'm not sure they're called now figures, but the figures that are um, pull 45 um, and a roll, and then a, a three quarter loop gets you up to the other 45. Goldfish, that's what I'm looking for. Um, and we also have three quarter loops that um, start horizontal or start vertical or what have you. So there the really isn't a very wide range of items to learn to call. Um, think of this and then move forwards. Pulling and pushing, some people find difficult. Um, you need to tell the judge whether the, the pilot is pushing or pulling. Um, stick forward, stick back. It's very easy if you're sitting inside the airplane because you're under lots of G in one direction or the other. But you need to tell the judge for humpty bumps and so on, whether it's a, a push forward at the top or a pull or what have you. So it isn't difficult. Um, the one thing we say to judges always is you have the best seat in the house. Um, 
where else could you sit and watch aerobatics and enjoy yourself uh, like this? So up to pilots before we, we move on, spend some time on the judging line. Um, there are two comments that we hear often over and over again at the judging line when pilots come down. And the first is, oh, I didn't think you could see things as clearly as this, oh dear. Um, and the second thing is how easy it is to see the faults and identify them. And pilots always go away from the judging line with a, a better view of how they should behave and what they should do next time. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of time going around the judging rules. Um, so this is another one that I have to start up. And let me put this down. Um, I'm going to share screen. And here we are again. Hopefully you've got that funny drawing of an airplane whizzing up. All right, um, so um, we'll take a little bit more time doing this and we'll go through all the different parts of judging. It isn't complicated, but there is a bit to learn and there is a bit to make sure that you, you understand. So let's start talking about what you're supposed to look at when the airplane's um, flying the sequence. And the first thing is, um, we call it the center of gravity track, track CGT. Um, think of the airplane as a blob, um, and it's the line that the blob draws in the sky as it moves around um, from left to right. And we use center of gravity track to um, evaluate and to judge what the airplane is doing when it's going horizontal and when it's going um, inverted or erect um, horizontal um, and when it's looping. All right, so if you see um, a square loop, for instance, then you're going to see a horizontal line to start with and then a vertical and then a horizontal line at the top, another vertical down and then a horizontal line at the bottom. So it's the horizontal lines that we're going to judge. You have to be a little bit careful when you're watching the airplane because if it's flying slowly, it might have its nose up quite a lot and you need to be careful to appreciate that it's not the angle the airplane's pointing that you're looking at, but it's the, um, the center of gravity, the track that the center of gravity of the airplane is moving along through the sky. The other thing that we look at is zero lift axis. Um, that's a, a bit of a funny expression, but what it what it's trying to say is, um, if you had the airplane quite high in the box and it flew a vertical down with no pitch input um, and in no wind, it really was a vertical line downwards, then the line through the airplane that you're looking at, the axis is the zero lift axis. In other words, it isn't lifting positive or negative and you are getting a vertical line. In modern um, carbon fiber airplanes um, and some of the later previous ones, um, the Yak 55 and so on, it's quite easy to see that the zero lift axis of the airplane is the one that you naturally see when you look at it. But in older airplanes, um, a K21 glider, um, a Cessna 152, if you see it, um, and the extreme example is a Tipsy Nipper, there aren't many of around, but um, a very duck shaped looking airplane. They don't appear to fly with the nose pointing in the right direction. So you have to be careful to understand the zero lift axis. Um, so you, when you're looking at verticals, you can see whether the airplane is, is truly um, flying a vertical down line, assuming there isn't any wind there. And we use zero lift axis um, on verticals and we use it on 45 degree angles as well. So all verticals and all 45s are judged by where the airplane is pointing, uh, by which I mean where the axis of the airplane is pointing. And we flip from one to the other um, on the way through judging. You have to, be, um, you have to note that the angle of attack um, is, is kind of taken into account. Let's move on. Oh, I can't move on. 
Next page. Here we are. Um, so here are a combination of things to look at. Um, there's a square loop on the left hand side. And so if somebody um, flew a square loop in front of you, you'd see central gravity check to start with in the horizontal. And then when the airplane pulls up to the vertical, you'd see zero lift axis. You need to look at the verticality of the airplane. At the top, then you've got center gravity track again, um, but the airplane might be going quite slowly, so it might be pointing upwards a bit. And then vertical down, zero lift axis, and then back to center gravity track again. In the figure of eight, which is underneath there, um, center gravity track to start with, and then zero lift axis up the 45 and then center gravity track all the way around the three quarter loop and the second three quarter loop these are all center gravity track with a bit of zero left axis in the middle and then center gravity track um, off the top again so we're flipping from one one um, way of judging the airplane to the next in the middle there's a pits um, you can see a bit more clearly with the pits that it's not so easy to look at and find the center uh, to find the zero left axis so from the bottom, um, center gravity track to start with, center gravity track around the corner, you're supposed to draw a nice radius. We don't want it to be a funny shape. Zero lift ax, um, axis up the line. Um, not very clear whether we should look at zero lift axis or center gravity track in the roll. There's a, um, a half roll there in, or a full roll in the middle. But nevertheless, um, zero lift axis afterwards, centre gravity track up around the radius the top, and then back to centre gravity track again in the horizontal. So you have to get used to flipping from one to the other and back again. The vertical S on the right hand side is all centre gravity track because it's all shapes in the sky. We want to see what the radius is like. When the airplane is flying um, 45s or verticals, um, if you're the judge, you need to be able to tell quickly whether the airplane is um, on the axis or not. And you need to say to the, to the scribe whether it's um, above the line or below the line. And um, you can use whatever words you like, but um, it's good to, to pick on um, some minimum words and use them all the time. So. Um, I find it easier to say whether the airplane is steep or shallow when it's on um, 45s up and down. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in vertical lines, um, if the canopy is um, towards the top, then positive up um, and positive down is easy to say, or negative up and negative down. Pick some words and fix them in your head and use them each time. Okay, now, um, once the sequence starts, um, um, we'll we get um, back to a little bit of the, the early part in a minute, but when the sequence starts, the airplane is going to fly in a box, an imaginary box in the sky, which is um, nominally a thousand meter cube. Uh, and so the top, um, which could be, actually be higher than a thousand meters, the top is, is at a thousand or higher. Um, some way uh, up from the base of the box, you've got the, the minimum altitude that pilots are allowed to fly. So um, that could be 200 meters for advanced power, 100 meters for unlimited, um, three and 400 meters for sports, um, intermediate and sports um, going up. So if the base of the box is a bit higher than the ground, um, then of course the top of the box is, is up as well. From where the judges sit, um, you've got a main axis, which is to the left and right, and a cross axis or a B axis. Some people call them A axis and B axis. Um, I think it's easier to call them main axis and cross. And uh, at the beginning of the um, set of sequences, the chief judge or the contest director or somebody will officially determine whether the wind is coming from the right or from the left because that, that's very important all the way through the sequence. Right, so judges are going to sit about 100 to 250 metres back from the edge of the box, so that you, you get a reasonable view. You mustn't sit too close. Um, and um, if you look at the sequence diagram, you'll find that the wind is drawn on it, and the figures must be flown into wind and out of wind. The figures must be flown in the right direction. When figures um, go across the box, 
if there's a quarter up or something like that, then um, the B axis, the cross box axis, the pilot can fly in either direction. It's his her choice as to whether they fly towards the judge or not. But there are some rules that we need to follow um, about the shape of figures and the way they're flown, which we'll come to a little bit later on. And the minimum operating heights are hundred meters. Are you still hear me? Yes. All right. My computer's playing funny tricks. Hundred meters for unlimited. Two hundred meters, which is about six hundred and seventy feet for advanced and intermediate uh, uh, in SIVA and glider, um, also unlimited and advanced. If you read the rules, you see those in uh, the United Kingdom. It's uh, three hundred meters for power sports and intermediate and glider sports and intermediate and 450 meters for power and glider club. Right, now, um, when the airplane gets into the box, you are going to see the pilots um, wriggling about a bit, flying some, some little figures to make sure that he hasn't left the Sunday times in the back of the airplane or the sandwiches aren't a bit loose. And this year, um, the allowed figures have changed. So um, for those of you who are used to judging last year, um, you have a little bit more to look out for. In um, club and um, sports in this country, you're still only allowed two half rolls, um, but um, we may well allow the push-pull stick inputs underneath. What you see um, when, you, when you see an airplane at a high level is the airplane will usually be turned upside down and then the pilot will pump the stick backwards and forwards a bit to make sure that the straps are tight and that um, everything's feeling good inside the airplane. This year also uh, at uh, the high levels you are allowed to fly any number of erect or inverted 90 degree to 360 degree turns consecutively or not but they must be without rolls. Right, they're just simple turns. So quite possibly this year, or quite probably, in fact, we're going to see people do the two half rolls and then pump the airplane up and down a little bit to, to check the straps. And then you'll see some turns. So um, you need to watch what's going on. If a bar inadvertently does a rolling turn, it's, it's bad news, that would be a penalty. And also, the pilot can fly up to three of the figures at the bottom there which is a straightforward stall turn, um, push, you know, pull, 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 push, push, pull, or push, push. So there are four types of those. Same with Humpties and those two um, figures of eight, one with two half rolls and the other, which is an inside, outside eight. So there are quite a lot of figures that the pilot can fly now in, in getting ready to make sure the, the airplane's um, good to go before the sequence starts. More to watch. Wing rocks, um, when that's all done, pilot's happy, um, or even if pilot's not, um, wing rocks to start the sequence. Um, normally wing rocks are done on a descending line, um, up to three of them. And so um, can be um, either direction, um, and there's no judgment on the size of the wing rocks. Um, Usually, if you're flying the airplane, it's good to look towards the judges and then away from the judges and then back towards the judges again so that you have a good idea of where you are in relation to the judges because they're the people that really matter. Um, if the sequence starts inverted, which sometimes they do, then um, the um, airplane can be flown on a vertical line and then can, can um, pull off the top of the vertical line to invert it. And the wing rocks can be done at any point in the, the diving entry, the horizontal line at the bottom of the box, or the vertical line. So you can even have the last wing rock in the vertical line. You need to read the rules um, a little bit to, to see this more clearly. Now we're back to um, basic rules of judging. So um, thinking of center gravity track and zero lift axis again. Um, if we have a simple figure like this uh, pull to the vertical half roll and then pull off inverted, then we are flying in on the center of gravity track on a level line. 
we've got a quarter um, loop which needs to be center of gravity track it's quite difficult to um, make that not look right but the slower a quarter loop is the more it's possible for a pilot to not make that a good radius so you, you need to be looking for a nice radius if it isn't a nice a, a good radius if it isn't obviously a quarter loop then we're looking probably for a little bit of a downgrade zero left axis in the vertical um, and then if there's a roll you really need to look at the the um, center of gravity track of the airplane as it, as it goes up through the roll you don't want it corkscrewing up and then zero left axis um, into the vertical again center of gravity track around the corner and off inverting and you would expect the airplane to be um, a quite a heavy negative angle of attack in this one so you, you're looking for a horizontal flown line now um, judging uh, you're always going to start with 10 points and um, the one thing to say to all the pilots perhaps who are listening to this is we really do start with 10 all the time and um, the only way the mark gets down from 10 is when the judges see something they don't like so starts good always can only get worse and go down a bit so um if the um if the airplane flies this figure and for instance starts it climbing at five degrees uh, our basic downgrade is one mark off per five degrees of um, pitch or roll error that we see so if the airplane starts the figure climbing um, at five degrees which would uh, be pretty obvious but it might um, and with a little bit of bank on let's say between five and ten degrees and if during the figure um, it yours um, on the rudder at five degrees and rolls about 10 degrees off axis in that roll on the way up and then ends with a bit of your and a bit of nose down at the top um or well not nose down but a bit of center of gravity dipping then um you would take marks off all the way through and and for the um scenario that i described you could easily end up with three marks to the figure one of the things you have to be clear in your head about is that uh, we're only taking marks off for things that we see that are wrong and just because a mark of three has arrived doesn't mean that it was truly terrible it just means that we've seen seven marks worth of downgrades to take off uh, if you have the good fortune to go to an international and watch the best unlimited pilots fly almost none of them ever get 10 for a figure so even the very best at world championships um, they get downgrades all the time so this is the the, the process that, that goes on in a judge's head throughout turns um, let's talk about turns for a minute um uh, one of the first things that you learn um, in a ppl once you've got clear of the ground is is how to turn the airplane <clears throat> and turns are usually um, done with a lot of coordinated rudder and roll to start with that's not an aerobatic turn we need to see the roll all the way to 60 degrees and then the airplane pulled round through the turn and then all the roll taken off afterwards and turns can be 90 degrees quarter of a turn half a turn 180 270 or 360 and it's like watching watching a, a, a marionette do um, a stage show if you like all the roll all the turn and then taking off all the roll again for power um, airplanes we need to see at least 60 degrees of bank um, for gliders um, they are meant to maintain exactly 60 degrees of bank so you can downgrade if you think that the turn angle gets too steep too high in turns though um, because the wind blows the airplane around we don't judge the shape of the turn it's very very difficult to do anyway so there's no correction for um, what you think will be a quarter or a half uh, an arc in the sky and the size of the turn doesn't matter either they can be very small or very big slow rolls uh, let's let's talk about um, rolls for a second um everybody's seen um, hopefully an airplane roll um if you go to an air display what you'll usually see is a barrel roll because a lot of airplanes don't fly upside down very well and uh in aerobatics we need to try as hard as we can to make the roll go around the 
if you like, the, the uh, axis of the airplane. It's not the zeroth axis because in a horizontal line we're we're on the center of gravity track. But what we want to see is the airplane rotate cleanly about the axis uh, uh, from nose to tail. Um, the figure that I've shown there is a two point roll in a, in a straight line. And so uh, you would expect to see the airplane roll half um, to upside down and then draw a little line and the roll half to the uh, right way up again. And if you have this on a 45 degree line, then you're going to see um, a little bit of uh, center of gravity pull to the 45 degree line. You need to check the axis of the airplane. And then you want to see the airplane roll about its axis. Uh, it needs to do it cleanly to upside down and then center gravity track around the little arc and off at the top again. Um, and being sure to see, of course, that you'll you'll probably see the, the airplane nose up a little bit. Flick rolls um, are not a PPL um, stunt or, or maneuver, um, only happen when you get well into aerobatics. Um, in a flick roll, the stick is moved very quickly back towards your stomach or away, if it's a negative one, to nearly stall the wings and then a rudder very quickly pride. And one wing flies much better than the other then. And so the airplane very quickly um, rotates uh, in, a, in a kind of um, um, a wriggly fashion. And you can see that shown here. Um, and at the end of um, a positive flip roll like this one, because you've pulled the stick back to start with, you would expect to see the airplane a little bit higher. But you will certainly see um, a, a difference in the axis. The one thing we see quite clearly here too is that the tail goes around in, in a kind of cone. It doesn't follow the middle of the airplane. And that's the thing to look at when you're, you're judging a flick. Does the tail rotate in a cone? Because if it doesn't, then really all you're seeing is an either end roll. Spins. Uh, spins always start in level flight, um, either erect as shown here or inverted. So the airplane slows down, slows down, slows down until it stalls. And then uh, pilot applies um, some rudder, a wing drops, and we get into the spin. It's important to um, check that the airplane hasn't um, turned and rolled off into the spin. We need it to stall properly, not very easy to spot, but you need to be uh, convinced in your head when you see the spin that the airplane really has stalled. And at a, uh, some moments, um, you won't really see the stall, but you can see a wing drop and then um, yawing, and then the airplane gets into the spin. This is a one turn spin shown here. Um, and you can, because the airplane is traveling at about uh, 60 or 70 miles an hour to start with, you can expect the spin to, to move forwards in a sort of arc. But when it gets to the end, the pilot is expected to stop the spin and move the airplane immediately to a vertical straight line. So you're into looking for zero lift axis, and then there'll be an arc to pull or push at the bottom. I'll come back to um, funny zeros later on. Um, they apply to these and to flicks. So let's look at loops now for a second. Um, loops can be all sorts of funny shapes and sizes. If you ever see a time moth doing a loop, you'll see something that looks much more like a, a handwriting L in the sky, which is a, a pull and then a line and then a little kind of radius at the top um, and then another down line. What we want to see is a really round loop. And just to make it difficult for pilots, we want to see it wind corrected as well. So um, if it's into wind or downwind, it doesn't matter. We are expecting the shape that we see in center gravity track to be a true circle in the sky. Um, when an airplane is going to do a loop in front of you, I strongly suggest that um, you use your finger or a pencil or a marker pen or something like that, and you follow the airplane until it starts to pull into the loop. And then you concentrate and remember the first quarter of the loop. That's the main radius, that's your kind of reference radius to look at the, the rest of the figure. You then want to see that radius, that shape, that size, uh, moving up into the second quarter of the loop and the third and the fourth. Um, 
for those of you who, who flown a bit and um, done some looping, you'll know that you have to um, move the stick forward as you go up into the loop because otherwise the looping shape gets tighter and tighter. So quite often at club and sports, we, shapes, we see shapes that are, that are really very different. There's a, a, a number of shapes shown on the right hand part of this diagram. Um, there aren't any really hard and fast rules to downgrading loops. What we say to people um, generally is if you see a little bit of shape um, bad, then it's one mark off. If the shape is um, quite significantly wrong, then it's two marks off. And um, if it's awful, then it's at least three marks off. The maximum mark off is three. You can see a number of um, loops and uh, a figure eight here at the bottom uh, with different um, flight lines drawn on them. And those are quite common to see at um, competitions. Um, the top right hand of these diagrams, figure four here, is the one that we see most often. The radius is maintained up past the vertical, but then the radius gets smaller and smaller as the airplane flies out. That's a very common sight. Would need to be downgraded by um, at least two marks. Half loops and rolls. Um, very often a half loop has um, some rolls, a half roll or more at the beginning or the end. And um, we need to find a way to downgrade if there's a line between the roll and the loop. What we ideally want to see is, uh, for instance, for um, if you look at the uh, top diagram, this is a half loop up to a half roll at the top. What we ideally want to see is um, a very nice looking uh, half a loop uh, with two identical sized radiuses, arcs. And then exactly as the airplane gets to the top and half rolls, the half roll needs to start. If we see a line after the half loop, then you need to downgrade the line. Um, in SIVA um, and in the UK, therefore, the rule is that if you see any line uh, after the half loop upwards before the roll, then you take a point off. If the line gets a bit more significant, um, you might get two marks off. If it gets really quite long, you might get to three marks off, which is about as high as you can go. And we use the radius of the loop, which is fairly easy to see as the, the limit. And at that stage, then we apply something we call perception zero. I'll come back to the zeros later on. I haven't talked about them yet. Um, but um, at that point, we apply a perception zero. We perceive that the figure's gone all wrong and the half roll is completely separate from the half loop. Um, in the States, um, and I presume in Canada, if you fly to IAC rules, you are allowed to fly a little bit of a line. But if you look at their rules, you'll find that there's not much of an indication as to how long the line can be. So I, I think this is a little bit clearer. You'll see um, half roll and half loop from the top going down, from the bottom going up, and you see them with negative and, and uh, so on lines at both ends. So there are quite a few variations of this. But um, rolls next to a half loop, be sure that you don't see a line, but if you do, start taking the downgrades. Stalk turns. Um, a very simple and elegant figure if it's flown nicely. Um, the aeroplane is expected to, um, in this simple diagram here, um, pull to the vertical and fly an exactly vertical zero left axis line. And then at some point when it's almost stopped, it, it yaws through 180 degrees, left or right, um, usually left. And then uh, it goes exactly on a, a zero lift axis down line. And the two um, airplanes that you can see here um, on the right hand side, they're wingtip to wingtip. That is um, as good as you can get. That's no downgrade stall turn hammerhead um, for you guys across the water. If the um, distance at the top that the aeroplane moves sideways is one extra wingspan, then it's one mark off, two extra wingspans, then it's two marks off and so on. It's quite difficult to um, achieve a no downgrade stall turn, uh, particularly with the pits. Um, the monoplanes, it's a little bit easier. 
So you're looking for the up on the entry, the zero axis on the way up, and then um, hopefully a really tight turn on the top. And probably the best airplane to do this is a CAP 232, which is a really nice big rudder and can turn quite smartly. Not to upset people with extras, of course, I'm sure you can do nearly as well. Humpty bumps. There are lots of Humpty bumps in the book. Um, basically, they are a, uh, a pull from level to some angle, 45 or vertical, um, and then a line at the top of the Humpty bump, a half loop, which can be positive or negative, and then a, a, a parallel line on the way down and back to pull out in horizontal flight again. What I've shown here is a, a 45 Humpty with a pull to a two or four roll, two by four. And so therefore with a pull around the top, not a push. And then on the down line, a half flip roll, which would leave the airplane inverted and then back out at the bottom. Whenever you see lines like this with a roll put on them, you should always uh, need the roll to be in the middle of the line. So there's an equal length of line before and after. And there are some um, fairly simple rules that, that allow us to work with that. Um, if the roll is um, early, which quite often happens, and the, the difference in the line lengths is um, the, the second line is twice as long as the first, then it's um, two marks off. And uh, even more extreme than that can be three marks off. And if you if you see this, um, see a roll in a line and it's not quite central, then you're half to one mark off, half to one mark downgrade. Tail sides. Um, you will see these from advanced level upwards um, in power, um, not glider, I don't think, don't have tail sides an advanced glider, but you certainly do in unlimited. Uh, very difficult figure to fly from a pilot's point of view without getting some sort of a downgrade. It's a little bit like a stall turn in that we expect the airplane to pull to the vertical, so there's an arc to look at, and then there's a zero lift axis vertical line, and then the airplane grinds to halt at the top, and then it's expected either to slide backwards and fall canopy down, which is what we've shown here, or it can slide backwards and fall canopy up, in which case the line will be black all the way through. The difficulty is, um, if you're flying the airplane, that if you get to the top and the airplane is really vertical, then you have no control over whether it's going to fall upright or inverted. So the usual trick is to put about five degrees of cheat in at the top. And uh, if it's a canopy down, then you'll pull the stick back slightly. And when the airplane stops, um, you put the stick right forward and you need the airplane to fall upside down. If it falls the wrong way, then of course we get a zero of the figure, uh, it's the wrong figure. But um, when you're judging a tail sign, you would typically see um, a relatively easy pull to the vertical. Most pilots can fly a pretty good vertical line, but then at the top, you are going to see a bit of a cheat. Unusually in this particular situation for this figure, if you see a cheat whilst the airplane is moving upwards, uh, let's say at five degrees, which is one mark off. When the airplane slides, it's still going to be at five degrees off, so it's still another mark off. So if you see a five degree cheat at the top of a, a tail slide, you're straight away into two marks off. The maximum mark can be eight. And then, of course, there are other things to look at as well. When the airplane falls, slides backwards, um, it'll usually pend in them a little bit on the way down. Um, there's no judging. Uh, assessment applied to that so the pendulums aren't judged you wait for it to get to vertical and then you're looking at the zero lift axis again rolling turns um lots and lots to look at in a rolling turn um and from inside the airplane lots and lots of things to concentrate on as well they're really not easy to get right what we are uh, looking for in a rolling turn, um, as shown here, this one is a, a 180 degree rolling turn with two rolls inwards. So the inner wing will be going downwards um, on the way through. <clears throat> what we're looking for is a, um, a constant rate of roll. We need to see the airplane rolling at the same rate all the way through. We need to see it flying in level flight all the time. We don't want to see it climbing or diving. 
and we need to see the parts of the figure where the airplane is either wings vertical or um, wings horizontal inverted or erect we need to see it in the right place on the way around the turn um, and this looks a bit complicated um, what i've shown is the airplane rolling twice in a wide edge turn and you would expect it to have its wings vertical at a quarter of the way into the first 90 degrees and it will be inverted halfway into the first 90 degrees and then wings vertical at three quarters of that 90 degrees and then wings level again at the end of that 90 degrees so um, those are forget that they're, they're 22 and a half degrees apart you can't really see that but um, we call those the um, intermediate points so you can look for the airplane being in the right um, attitude and, and having turned the right amount around the rolling circle at, at these points on the way through the figure and at the end is very likely that the, the um, airplane will end up skidding with a lot of rudder applied and what we're looking for is a center of gravity track in exactly the right direction so it might be pointing in a different direction the heading might be different let me go um, to the next slide this shows something much more like um, what we normally see where um, the pilot will roll and pull and then roll and push to get round through the 90 degrees it's kind of the natural thing to do um, if you're um, flying the airplane then please use lots of rudder on the way round always in towards the inside of the turn and then you can turn the axis of the airplane to to keep in with the the turn itself the shape of the turn positioning um, we need to make a mark up for where the, the figures are flown in the sequence um, when you're sitting on the judging iron looking at the the, the space the, the sky in front of you um, you can tell whether the airplane's more left um, then it goes to the right. You can tell if it gets a long way to the left or the right. Um, and you can tell if it gets a bit near or a bit far away. And what you really want the pilots to do is to fly the figure so that you're able to judge it properly. Um, if the judge can't judge the figure properly because the pilots put it somewhere miles away in, in the wrong place, then we need to downgrade what's going on. Um, and in uh, SEVA and in, in, the, in the British Airbag Association, we use this left-right system where um, if, it, if you think a figure is a little bit left of where it ought to be um, um, for good marking, then stick an L, say left, to your scribe. If it's a long way left, it's left-left, right and right-right and so on. Now, obviously, you're going to see some figures to the left of you and some to the right of you, but, but what I'm saying is that um, you need to judge where you think the pilot should have flown the figure. Um, and if it's too far to the left or too far to the right, or too near or too far, <clears throat> then you can say um, left, right, near, far, and the scribe will write them down. And at the end of the flight, then you can use the figures that are written down as about half a mark each of a downgrade. It's quite an easy way to, to arrive at your downgrade mark. Um, in the States and Canada, uh, you probably still use, um, it's not perception, what do you call it, uh, presentation, uh, which is a, a, a very hard thing to describe. And that's what we used to do. And we used to find that, that uh, people didn't really think about it until the end of the flight. And then it was just a guess. And this, this system that we use now is a lot easier for judges and a lot more practical for pilots to understand. So let me talk about um, errors a bit. Um, there are three sorts of terrible mark that you can give a pilot. One is zero, where you've seen so many downgrades in the figure that there's nothing left. Um, 10 of them are gone. And so you end up with a numeric zero. Um, it also applies if you see, um, I've said here, cumulative errors in pitch and roll and, and yaw. You have to add all the errors up as you, as you go through the figure. If you see um, a spin that you think doesn't spin or um, a flick roll where you are pretty sure that the flick hasn't really worked properly or a slide where the airplane didn't slide, it just fell over at the top. 
then it's, it's very hard to be very accurate about what's going on. And this is what we call, um, this is where we give a perception zero. We perceive that the figure hasn't been flown properly. <clears throat> so you can give a PZ, a perception zero. Um, uh, it uh, isn't used um, away from the SIVA environment. So um, America, Canada, you won't see a PZ, um, presumably in South America as well. But we think it's it's a, a very good way to say to the pilot, hey, we just do not believe that you did this right, so we'll give a PZ. And the scoring system, um, the scoring system effectively, the calculation, it, it has to see more than half um, of the judges giving a PZ before it really does anything dramatic. Otherwise, uh, it's usually discarded. So you need a majority. And the other zero, the big one, is called a hard zero. If the figure um, or if any figure is flown with any part of it that's genuinely wrong. Um, in other words, let's say if it's supposed to be um, a, a single roll and it's flown as a, a two point hesitation roll, or it's a two by four, two quarter roll, and it's flown as a half roll, then it's wrong. And then we must give a hard zero. And um, hard zeros uh, at the end of a sequence, the chief judge goes around. If anybody's given a hard zero, there's usually a, a little discussion then on the judging line to try and um, determine whether the figure really should be given a hard zero or not. And uh, if more than enough judges um, agree, more than half the judges agree, um, and particularly if the chief judge is pretty sure, then the figure we get a hard zero, and that's a definite zero in the scoring system. When we do things at internationals, um, a hard zero is always, we, we get into a huddle, go into a tent, and we always look at the video, and we always review the figure on the video. And it has to be a very serious discussion to make, to get it to a hard zero. And quite often there are long discussions, and a pilot is given the benefit of the doubt, <clears throat> and a, an ordinary downgrade is applied. So numeric zero is a zero, a perception zero is a, maybe probably zero perceived and a hard zero is a definite mandatory you can't have any marks on that figure so that's a, a, a brief trawl through um, the main parts of judging um, that's really very quick and um, you'll need to look through the VA rules to see a lot more than that um, and does anybody get any, any quick questions here now Gosh, we must be doing well, Rob. Well, there are a few in, in comments beside, but uh, one question, uh, the last one is interesting, is what's the best uh, positioning you do for different figures? And uh, well, the best answer is you've got to place yourself in the position of the judges. If, if they actually can't see the shape of the figure correctly, they are going to downgrade. Um, and the downgrades can go at just two marks because you can't judge an angle or things like that. So look on the, the cross box axis, obviously, is going to be tricky to judge if uh, you do it straight in front of the judges. And the same thing for any figures which has got a, a, a round element. We, know we have to judge the shape of the round element. If we can't see it, if it's a round just in front of the judges, obviously, it's going to be tricky. And you might be just downgraded because we can't judge it properly. Okay, um, yes, now we've got a there. I can see there are quite a few questions. Um, Stall turn right in front of the judges. Um, yes, it's hard to see the radius. If you're a pilot, what you have to do is show the judge, um, um, what can I say, the right thing. You have to show the judge enough to enable the judge to mark the figure. If you do a stall turn in the middle of the box in front of the judges, of course, it's impossible to see what happens at the top. And a judge is entitled, as Rod says, to take two marks off for every little bit that he can't see and judge. It's up to you, the pilot, to put everything in a place where it can be judged. So if you get a store turn, um, it's in the, you, you would normally put it in the middle of the box. Put it um, 100 metres or 150 metres downwind or upwind so that we can we have a little bit of a side view on it and then we can see it a bit better. It's up to you to show the judge what he needs to see. So um, if a judge can't see something properly, then um, yes, it's two marks downgrade. Um, in gliding, um, if you wander off um, too far away from the judge and the judge can't judge it, then you'll get PZs because the judge 
perception is that you're not applying the right figure at all. Um, so um, PZ became quite important um, a little while ago. We had a few occasions, um, I seem to remember some internationals too, where there was um, a plain loop in the middle of a sequence and uh, a pilot would fly the loop right at the front face of the box so that you really couldn't judge the shape of the loop. And so the judge has to say to himself, this guy stuck it in front of me like that, so I can't see it, so I'm going to downgrade it. And pilots, you have to show us what you want to do. Um, positioning, um, it's not easy from the <laughs> inside the airplane, I know. Um, but um, try and use the space in front of the judges. Um, some figures will inevitably be at the upwind end, some at the downwind end. Uh, if you have cross box work to do, then some will be nearer and some will be further away. Just put the figures where the judge can judge them well and, and you should be okay. Right, I'm back now on um, another. We have another question from Ian. If yes. Ian has got his hand up. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rod. Nick, I, I wonder just on that same one then, um, could you say a bit more? Is there, is there anything that is best placed perfectly in front of the judges or, or is everything slightly better with a little bit of offset? Uh, and I'm thinking just the A-axis now because that, that's where, where perhaps you've got a little bit more choice. Sure. Um... Well, you have to look look to um, the flow of the sequence and how things progress from the start to the finish. Um, you can't fly everything in front of the judges. Um, it, it just is impossible. Figures um, take space, and uh, it looks much better from a judge's point of view if you space the figures in time regularly and, and give a second or two in between each figure um, uh, to get on with them. So you will fly some upwind. Um, you will fly some downwind. But as long as they're easy enough to see and and all the parts of it can be seen then you'll be fine um th this left right thing is only for when the airplane is too far to the left or too far to the right and in in the flow of the sequence is in a in an odd and unacceptable position and of course if you get it in a place where um, things can't be judged then that's not so good at all right um back out of zooming around the rules and somewhere down here, um, I'm going to, let me share screen thing again, share screen. No, I'm going to be back to where I was. Wait a minute. Right, so we've done warm up figures. Um, that's better. Here we go. So we're back to talking to judges again. Um, little obvious things. Um, working on the judging line um, is a bit of work and uh, if it's a very sunny day, uh, you need to be careful that you don't get frazzled by the sun. So take a pair of glasses, um, take a comfortable chair. There's nothing much worse than sitting on, a, on an uncomfortable chair for a long time. <clears throat> take some sun cream. Um, sometimes at the end of the day, when you all get back in the clubhouse, um, you can tell the judges because they're the ones with one side of their face sunburned and not the other. And, um, so take some, some sun cream, pens, pencils, all that sort of thing and some water. We usually try and take water and soft drinks down to the judging line, but you do need something with you. Go out and walk around between sequences. Um, you'll get pretty bored just sitting down. Take a copy of the rules with you. Inevitably, it doesn't matter who you are, um, You at the end of a fight, you'll go, did I get that right? Did I do the right thing? Um, have a quick look in the book and make sure that you've done the right thing. Um, at the end of a sequence, uh, there's a rule that uh, we apply everywhere, <clears throat> which says that whilst the paperwork is still in the judge's hands, he can change it. 
But as soon as the paperwork leaves the judge's hands and goes to the chief judge, then it's fixed. So um, if you see something that you're not sure about in a, in a sequence and you give a mark, and then you're worried at the end, you quickly get the rules out and find that you didn't do the right thing, you can change the mark and initial the change whilst it's in your hands, whilst you've still got the paperwork in your hands, but once it's gone, it's gone. Um, and take some peppermint sweets or something. You're gonna talk a lot during the day, um, and so your, your mouth will go dry. So um, we're an hour in now, tramping on. So I'm gonna talk to, this is for pilots really. So let's get off judging for a minute, but we're talking about what really works for judges when you're sitting in the airplane. Now, the key topics, um, I can't emphasize these enough. Um, people still don't really pay enough attention to some of these things, and it always leads to tears. So preparation of the day is absolutely critical. Everything you do on the ground before you get in the airplane is free. It doesn't cost you anything at all. And once you're um, in the airplane and on the way, then you can't go back and look up anything and find out or ask questions. So preparation of the day is critically important. Sequence cards. Um, in our software, we print little sequence cards and <clears throat> they're pretty small. Um, they might not suit you. You can always go into the office, um, talk to Jen or whoever's in the office and uh, use the printer to make a bigger copy, a bigger version. Um, and so that it fits on the, on the uh, instrument panel of your airplane so you can really see it. You need to learn the sequence thoroughly. That's a pretty obvious thing to say. Um, I used to find that extremely difficult and I used to look at the sequence diagram on, on the way through the sequence, but it's not easy to do. Um, whenever you look at the sequence diagram in the middle of a flight, you're just flying along straight and level and that doesn't really help. So you need to learn it thoroughly. Um, I'll talk about warm-up figures in a minute. Um, there are a lot of things you can do with warm-up figures and they're not very obvious. Um, and, and flying the box, I called it to start with. Um, I'll talk about wing rocks again. And then um, we'll get back to what we've just been talking about, which is flying the figures in the right place so they can be well judged. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a very trite thing to say, but um, what I would say to pilots is try to keep judges answers, don't give them questions. Now, answers isn't a very um, understandable thing to say, but if you fly a figure in front of a judge and you fly something that's not what the judge expects, then they have questions in their head that they got to sort out. And for a judge that's concentrating on everything that's going on in a figure, uh, having to resolve questions and work out what on earth the pilot's doing leads to lots of downgrades. So please try to make it obvious and right and don't give the judge questions to resolve. Um, obviously, you need to concentrate on every part of every figure. Um, it's, it's commonplace to see pilots rushing and thinking ahead to the next figure all the time and not paying attention to every bit of every figure. Um, so we're going to talk about that. So on the ground, um, there's a whole lot of stuff up in the briefing to look at. Runway, frequencies, wind, judge, position, uh, weather boxes and all that sort of stuff. So you need to have a good idea of that. <clears throat> we publish um, an overhead view of the box on the website, and it is a good idea to print that off. And we're also talking this year about publishing some kind of um, slant views. In other words, what the box would look like when you're heading into it from about a couple of thousand feet. And it looks quite different. So um, watch the web and, and maybe we'll have them up um, soon enough. Um, energy, food. Um, it's very easy to um, spend a lot of time with your mates and talk a lot and not really prepare yourself, your body for the flight. So eat, drink, and make sure that you're not going to run out of energy in the middle of the flight. Um, there used to be buckets of cold water with small Mars bars in them and that sort of thing back in the old days because that was thought to be the right thing to do. Um, I'm not sure whether sugar gets into your body as quickly as that, but that, that was uh, that was what was done. But don't get dehydrated. It's very easy on a hot day. Um, Melanie Essels ran a, a, a very good um, 
Zoom thing about six or eight months ago, can't we call them now, NBAA, um, and she talks about preparation of your body and a bit of exercise and so on to make sure that you're ready to go. Um, toilet. <laughs> Don't get stuck away from the toilet for the wrong time. You need to have a nervous pee before you get in the airplane. Do go and do it. Uh, we'll talk about the sickness card in a minute. Um, earlier on, you've got to have got the fuel, the oil, and the loose objects sorted out. And uh, um, once you're in the airplane and going, anything that gets loose inside it is, is a terrible distraction and not good. Uh, and then you get in and go, and after that, all the mistakes get to be downgraded and they become very costly. Could you start up early? Um, the CD will talk to you about um, getting in the right place at the right time, being off the ground, and you've got the radio calls to think about getting in touch with the chief judge. You must, must talk to the chief judge before you get into the box and start your flight. Sequence cards. Um, this colourful thing is not an invention by me. It was a sequence card made by a sports pilot a few years ago, um, which he inadvertently dropped somewhere and I found, and every time he sees it now, he's a bit embarrassed, but it's a lovely example of how you can mark a sequence card up to tell yourself what to do. <clears throat> uh, he's done what I always used to do, which is mark the interwind parts of the sequence in yellow. So every time you look at um, something which is in yellow, you know you should be flying into the wind. And if it's not yellow, then you should be flying out of the wind. Uh, so an easy kind of, um, uh, easy thing to recognize whilst you're flying the sequence. Make them as large as possible so that you can read them. Um, use nice bright colors like that. Um, write instructions on them. Um, you might decide before you fly, having watched one or two other people, that you definitely want to fly the cross box something towards the judges and not away. Um, so put lefts and rights on, um, and, and uh, then you won't have to make a decision in the airplane. You will be mentally extremely busy whilst you're flying the sequence, and actually having to make a constructed decision is very hard and very disruptive. So you can do all this on the ground, and you don't have time to think about it in the aeroplane. Learn the sequence. Um, one of the things you see quite a lot, um, and we had a picture before we started this little section, is people hand walking. Uh, it's quite instructive to half shut your eyes and walk through the sequence and wave your arms around um, as though you're in the aeroplane. Just bear in mind though that um, actually sitting in the aeroplane and moving the stick and rat around and, and so on is not like hand walking, it is different, but at least hand walking gives you the opportunity to, to think clearly and, and step your way through the sequence. Try and make a plan to locate where figures are, um, especially the first one, the first one's the important one. And it's helpful to write on your colorful card um, what I call gate heights here. In other words, heights that you shouldn't be below um, to start a figure, and that's something you can check on the way through. Um, you could mark where you're going to be low in the sequence, um, in a glider that's at the end, but in a power aeroplane, particularly a powerful powered aeroplane, it might be somewhere during the sequence and you might be higher at the end. Um, cross box directions we've talked about. Um, it's quite useful to use the words toward and away instead of right and left, just in case you have to change your mind in the sequence because um, toward the judge, you can easily change your way and then it's the opposite in the other direction. Um, and warm-up figures. Um, now let's talk about warm-up figures. Um, and of course, before you're off the ground um, in the clubhouse at a competition, if there's something you're not sure of, for goodness sake, go and ask somebody. Um, make sure you don't ask a pilot who would like to give you a bum steer, but um, everybody usually will, will be very free and easy with advice. So, Get advice. Flying around the box. Okay, we're back to this box diagram again. Um, this is my suggestion. Don't have to do it, but I think all this is very helpful. When you get off the ground and the uh, chief trust is right, box is yours. I suggest you fly around the box. You need to look at where the judges are. Um, occasionally, here pilots after a sequence say, I never saw the judges, I didn't know where they were. <laughs> The judges are the people you're doing this for. They're the audience, and you need to really know where they are. So fly around. If you fly 
uh, in a square around the box, probably not marked on the ground at a British competition, but um, you're back to the, the photograph of the box from the web. Um, it'll give you a good idea of where you need to place things on the way through the sequence. Now, um, warm up figures. Um, you're allowed to fly into the box um, and then fly a, a down sloping line to your two half rolls <clears throat> and anything else, of course, that you want to fly. And then you can fly a, an up line to get back to where you were and then go around to um, being in the right place to fly the sequence, to get into the sequence. But look, um, think about this. If you're allowed to fly a down line to get a bit of speed and fly your two half rolls, for goodness sake, make it a 45 degree down line because you can practice flying a 45 degree down line and they will happen during the sequence. People who fly 15, 20, 25, some odd degree of angle down into the box. Um, firstly, that doesn't really help because you're not practicing anything. And secondly, it's quite hard to tell looking past the wings where you are. If you fly a 45 degree down, you can look out at the front of the airplane and see the middle of the box where you want to target the middle of your sequence. So fly a 45 down, pull out level, do your two half rolls, and do think of them as, as a figure. Think of them as two half rolls in a figure. Don't just wander around the half roll and wriggle the airplane around a bit, but really try and do it. They are practice. Um, if you're above sports level, then you, you may well have some other figures you're allowed to fly. Um, really do your best to fly them accurately and uh, make some benefit from what they are. When you've done them, then you can fly a 45 degree up line and get back to where you were. I think this is it's very helpful to actually use this as, as practice before you fly the sequence. And when you get around to flying the wing walks, um, don't do, my advice, don't do little wing wobbles, make them 90 degree rolls there and back, because it's practice. You can practice quarter rolls, three of them. It's all really good. And finally, um, if anything goes wrong in the sequence, stop, do some wing wags, take a break, um, take the weight off your mind and fly around for a minute or so and make your mind up what you're going to do. Carrying on, thinking to yourself, oh God, I've made a mistake. I better not let anybody know it's terrible. I'll just do the next figure is not really the best way forwards. Take a break. Warm-up figures, um, talked about a little bit before, so there are more um, if you're intermediate and above um, in power, not glider. There are more that you can do this, this year. Uh, I really would recommend that you do some of them because they'll, <clears throat> they'll help you to relax and settle down and, and waggle the airplane around and get used to getting ready for your first figure. Wing rocks, um, my strong advice is make them 90 degree either direction and make sure that you dive into the middle of the box um, and get in the right place at the right speed and the right height to do the first figure. Uh, it's, it's, um, it does a lot for your peace of mind to know that when you get to the first figure, you're in the right place, right time, right speed, right height. So now, um multitasking um <laughs> everybody talks about multitasking um if you're married or you have a girlfriend your um, partner i'm sure will tell you that they're much better at multitasking than the blokes are um i'm not sure whether anybody's better or worse than this than, than anybody else but when you're flying the sequence in the airplane you have got six things to do and they go on all the time. You've got to fly the airplane. So you've got to do speed, height, um, attitude, engine, revs, prop, temperatures, pressures, all that sort of stuff. I know they're instinctive and they're in the background, but it's a channel of stuff you've got to run. Second thing is you have to fly every single part of the figure you're in, and you have to fly it very carefully. If you go halfway through a figure, don't start looking to the next figure to see what you've got to do. Make sure that you get all the way to the end of the figure you're flying, and fly carefully to the best of your ability. When you come out of the figure, you need to know what the next figure is because you're going to get into it very quickly. 
um, and hopefully in learning your sequence you've gone through the business of making sure that, that this pops into your mind quite easily but you need to be out of every figure um, again at the right speed height place and all the rest of it and the right direction to start into the next figure so um, that's important that's that's channel three separate from all of that um, if you've got a moment to spare you have to look out of the window and you have to try and work out where the judges are to make sure you're going in the right direction um, and that takes a little bit of time it's not when you start doing this stuff it's not very easy it runs away very quickly but um, with a bit of experience in between figures or on the down lines of figures it helps to look around and check where the judges are and sometime you'll find you're not where you want to be and things are going wrong so uh, you need to adjust where you are and get back into the right place um, you might think that in your high power high speed whiz around airplane the wind doesn't make much difference to you but when you start flying a sequence you are in effect um, drifting along in the wind exactly like a balloon does uh, if there's a 20 knot wind um, uh, and it's, direct, it's just a straight hit wind on the main axis of the box it'll take you four or five minutes to fly the sequence and at 20 knots in four or five minutes you'll go a long way so it really does make a difference to you so look at where you are over the ground and make sure that you can take some action to get further back into wind or perhaps um, side to side on the box to get back into the right place and you really have to monitor your situation all the time you must detect if anything goes wrong and you must make a plan to do something about it now making plans in the middle of the sequence at 150 miles an hour with the next figure coming and the judges watching is not a very easy thing to do but it's it's a whole separate channel and you have to do something um every now and again not very often fortunately but every now and again um, somebody will get an early figure in a sequence wrong and then fly a whole series of figures afterwards in the wrong direction and we all sit on the judging line smiling and watching it going on and what's happening is a pilot who's trying very hard to fly the figures but isn't paying attention to where the ground is and what direction he's flying things so um there you go so here um it's a bit like instrument flying if you've ever done any of that there are six separate channels of stuff to do all the time and it's bloody hard work i know so from the moment you enter the box try and make it neat tidy um judges do watch your warm-up figures funnily enough um not so much perhaps at, at uk national events but i can certainly tell you at internationals when a pilot flies into the box and starts doing his warm-up figures all the judges pay attention because it tells them whether the pilot is going to be any good or not and it's a very interesting exercise to watch so warm-up figures and all that um, you are being observed and the judges also have to make sure that you're not doing anything that you shouldn't so there is a bit of attention going on from the ground make sure you start in the right place at the right height um, in the figure that's a key thing uh, you it's a great deal of of um what kind of peace of mind if you start the first figure in the right place at the right heart, uh, height at the right speed it's a very good feeling and it, and, it, and it gives you a good mental attitude going forwards Try and check where the judges are after every figure. I know it's difficult, um, and I know you'll get two or three figures without looking, but see if you can, can make it a regular thing um, and proceed at a regular pace through the sequence. Um, now, here are just some, some simple things from the judging uh, point of view. Um, these are from me. Other judges will say maybe the same sort of thing. If you're going to fly a four-point roll, um, it's a very natural approach to flying a four-point roll um, if you remember when you started flying in a 152 or a robin or a pa28 or one of those old things um, that when you fly the airplane on its side there's a, a terrible tendency to stand on the top rudder and push the nose of the airplane up because you think you're going to fall down sideways well that's kind of natural but if you fly a four-point roll and you do what's uh, what you're looking at now nose up level nose up and level you give the judge two questions on the way through here is the airplane flying level should i downgrade is it falling is it going up what's going on um, 
in an airplane that rolls reasonably quickly uh, than doing what's in the bottom half of the diagram here and flying the roll so that the axis remains completely horizontal looks better. You need to get on quite smartly and, and fly the rolls so that the airplane doesn't drop too much, but the judge really can't see it dropping. All he can see is the attitude of the airplane. And, and um, the second um, diagram here is what well, is likely to get you a better mark than the first one. You also find um, if you crank on top rudder that when you do the next quarter roll to go wings horizontal, it's very hard to get the rudder off. And so you'll find that you change direction and you start um, yawing and, and screwing sideways across the box. And that can make quite a lot of difference. So try not to do that. Well, um, this is even more obvious if you dive 45 up um, and do a two or four and the 45 up, then uh, flying that funny angle on the middle of it makes the judge think, um, is it right? Do I need to take a mark off? No, probably not, but you've got to think to do it. And in this particular situation, jamming on top rudder and then um, doing the next quarter roll will almost certainly lead to you being off axis because it's very hard to get the rudder off in the meantime. So it's a, another example, um, but on an angle at the previous page. Rolls need to be in the middle of lines. So um, in the top diagram, length A equals length B, and there's nothing to downgrade. But in the bottom diagram, which is something we see quite often, the airplane um, pulls up into a 45, um, and either we have a long line and a short line, or um, a little short line, quick roll, and then a longer line afterwards that runs over speed. And then even if the sticks only pull back a very slight amount, the radius gets quite tight at the top, and then it gets bigger uh, as you go down through the rest of the, of the half Cuban. <clears throat> and that sort of shape is, um, it happens often, um, and it gets lots of downgrades. Um, that's probably about a, a six point maneuver. Second lines up and down. Um, when you fly a roll on a down line, which you won't at club um, and you rarely will at, at sports, you of course are looking straight at the ground and you can probably see the blades of grass and um, there's a ground rush written all over it and there's a great tendency to um, on a stall turn for instance fly a line and then a roll and then pull very quickly and only fly a second short line and these lines have to be the same length it's not the same time it's the same length so um, in your training, particularly when somebody's training you on the radio, be sure that you get the lines same up and down. Um, radius corners I've talked about quite a lot. Um, it's quite easy if the radius is not very good to downgrade it. Um, you can see it very easily from the judging position. Shapes of half cubans, shapes of quarter loops, um, not so often like that, but can be. Positioning, um, not going to go back through that too much. I've talked about it quite a lot. So. Um, the, the word in the book is that the pilot is expected to fly each figure in an optimum location for the judge to judge it. So you have to make your mind up where you're going to want to fly. Um, now, just to make a point again, uh, judges only downgrade what they see. Um, they won't downgrade you, hopefully, for anything they don't see. So it's very important when you're in the plane to fly it for the best presentation, uh, that's the American word, for the best presentation to the judging panel. Be clear and accurate about what you're doing. Um, if you've got yourself a super expensive carbon aeroplane, <coughs> sharp corners um, are degrading criteria, don't care about that. So um, doing um, plus 8G into a sort of doesn't really impress anybody at all. Um, it's just a corner. And so don't bother, just make them nice and smooth. Um, you only know the G in the aeroplane, we don't know what it is on the ground. And to make the point again, every figure starts with a 10 in the hand, and only you can downgrade it. So try and keep the performance somewhere in front of the judges, smooth and tidy, and so on. Um, when the carbon aeroplane started to be popular at international events, we got pilots that advanced flying 3,000 foot verticals in front of us. And they're ever so boring, they're not really very impressive at all. So um, size really 
isn't an issue. It's, it's the shape of the figure and the relationship of the bits inside. If you start to get a bit low in a sequence, take a break, please. Um, the, the break um, values have come down this year, they're less. Um, go and look it up in the book how much a break will cost you in, in, a, in a penalty. <clears throat> but if you get low, don't scratch on and, and, and um, try and keep going. Um, I could spend hours talking about flying sequences low because I've been at Yak 55 for some years. And the first couple of figures were in the top of the box and the rest of it was all flown at about 600 feet. So I, I know all about that. But if you get low, take a break and a judge will respect you for, for getting a bit of height again. Come on. Um, you're there to try and create a good impression. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of talking analog stuff all the time here, but um, I, this is me saying give the judges simple answers make everything neat and tidy and don't hurry um, and, and don't try and be too violent um, if you give a judge a question the judge really has to stop his mental flow and try and work out what's going on and that's quite disruptive from a judge's point of view um, this is a typical discussion on an international judging minds john gaylard the south african judge um, and uh, everybody's standing around and he's going through a sequence and checking with everybody um, to see uh, whether hard zeros should be agreed or not. That's a, a very typical discussion. And I'm done. Um, I hope that's really been helpful. There's a, a lot to take in. Um, all of this is available on the website, so you can download the PDFs and you can look at what's going on. And I hope that's all been helpful. Um, with a bit of luck, um, this thing will be available on YouTube as a, a rewatch, so you can dip back into it and see it at other times in the future. So um, enjoy that. And um, are we? Do we have any more questions that we need to say? Positioning we talked about. Um, wind direction and wind strength. I have talked about. Um, honestly, uh, if it makes you come to life for you. Um, when you're flying a sequence in the box, if you fly all the lines up and down wind and across wind in the same length, you are just like a balloon in the box and you will drift with the wind and you need to do something about it. Um, we set you a little test and um, Rod and I had a chat a few days ago and we decided that Rod's the man to talk you through the test. So, um, Rod. Keith, Keith has a question before. Yes, Keith, go. You're muted. Super silent, Keith. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. My new button was blocked. Nick, what I was pointing out about the wind direction, I saw this at US Nationals. A pilot went up and was doing a stall turn, and you could see them being pushed by the wind in the stall turn. Yeah. They turned downwind, came back down, still kept getting pushed into the box, and almost got pushed out of the box. So that's why I made the comment for some of the pilots to think about wind direction and what it does. And if some of the comments on some of the pilots were, well, you should really learn how to do that stall turn to the left and to the right, so that if you turn into the wind and you're coming down, you don't get pushed to the back end of the box because the next maneuver is now up against the far edge of the box and you're completely downwind and you're cornered. So right. that's, that's why I made that comment. That's just for, for thoughts for some of the pilots. Okay, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, if you fly a glider, then you can do various clever things with the pull up into the vertical to give yourself a skid. And then it's not so difficult to go in either direction. But if you fly a powered airplane, <clears throat> if it's a Lycoming like, airplane, really stall turns are going to be to the left. They're quite hard to do to the right. Um, if you fly a Russian engine airplane, a Sukhoi or a Yak, then you're going to be doing them to the right. Uh, but yes, if you've got a stall turn if on the main axis with a quarter up, then run the quarter so that you stall turn into wind and it'll look a lot better than stall turning out of wind where the, the, the wind pushes you and makes a horrible shape. 
Um, interesting little point, whilst I think of it, um, if any of you fly model aerobatics and you go and get judged at the competition flying model aerobatics, um, because the pilots on the ground, um, verticals are judged by the judges for true verticals. So if a, if a, a, a model's in a heavy wind and uh, has to fly a vertical, then the model has to fly at a funny angle in order to make the line vertical rather than the zero lift axis. And so that's completely different. Everything in real airplanes happens the other way. All right, Rod, over to you. Okay, yeah. So in summary, what we've learned for the pilots is really preparation. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen as well. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, so quickly, uh, that's from the, the judge's perspective. So now it's fresh in your mind. If you see this uh, as a series of warm up figures, as a simple stall turn, and then is a push exit. And as you see, there's a bit of a wobble to check the harness and everything. And then an inverted 180 turn, and it's finished with a half roll back to erect. Uh, is that acceptable? I see Eric nodding. No. You've got five seconds to make your mind up. We will score your 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 result, your questions, uh, answers. But basically, yes, it is acceptable now except if you are club sport level or glider, but if you are a glider, you're not going to do that because you're already down 2000 feet. But if, uh, if it's a power plane, now all these figures are acceptable um, at a civil level because uh, the rules have been quite relaxed. So 180 inverted turn is now part of the, the select, selection you can, you can use as uh, Nick described earlier. Next question, you've got uh, this diagram here, which is flown this way. And as you see, it starts with uh, five eighths of a loop and a positive snap roll on the 45 down line. And what you see is the plane coming in, doing his five eighths and flying through the low line, pulling out horizontal. And then you've got an off Cuban where the aircraft pulls up, does this half roll on the 45 down and ends up again below the low line. And then you've got a simple roll, which is below the low line and a stall turn or hammerhead in American with two half rolls. So one half roll on the way up, which is assumed to be correct on the half roll on the way down and an exit. The exit is, as you notice here, higher than entrance. How many points would you give to that? <clears throat> and what, what, can you, what can you mark? So the first question, if you go for the first figure, um, obviously, how many, how many figures are you going to, to <coughs> penalize for the low line? Eric says four, he says one. Well, the, the rule applied strictly effectively is if the figure ends below the line because that's where it gets it gets wrong you've got three lows here because in the first one the pilot pulls out too low and ends up low and so that's a low mark the second figure he comes up to the top but ends up below the low line again that's going to be another low mark and as nick said if you get low take a break go back up and carry on because uh, low penalties are much more severe than uh, interruption. The pilot erected, elected to, to carry on and did his roll below the low line and that's penalized as a low line. Unfortunately, he managed to pull a long vertical to his hammerhead after his roll and he pulled out above. So he's back into the, the realm of legal. So this one would get three three lows for just a series of figures and uh, depending which level you fly the lows cost so many points could be quite detrimental to your score next one is a simpler figure and uh, it shows what the first figure is going to be and you see the plane coming in and doing his wing rock so we discussed wing rocks 
and he starts on a decent uh not quite not quite 45 but perhaps 35 degree line you've got the first wing rock on the 45 down then the planes pulls out level second wing rock pulls into a vertical and there's another wing rock there and goes inverted at the top before starting his first figure is that acceptable Say is yes. There's absolutely no problem with that because the wing rocks can be uh, decomposed in three different places effectively as long as they are not uh, in, in, in any other any other conditions. They are, they are acceptable like this. It's not a wing rock competition. So it is not a wing rock competition. Look, as long as you fly something that looks roughly like three wing rocks, you can fly them outside the box, inside the box, and in the vertical, if necessary, in order to get into your sequence. Well, there must be at least 45 degree bank to, to show they are on. Well, level. maybe, yes. <laughs> um, from, from a judge's perspective, often the pilots bank just to see where they are coming into the box as well, which is, uh, as a, a chief judge, you always have your whistle and you're ready to blow to say wing rocks, but it's not quite wing rocks because the pilot is actually trying to see where he is. Then he dives and then he does the wing rocks. So if the wing rocks are clearly dynamic wing rocks, we know that's the actual wing rocks you mean to show you're going to start. Whereas if it's a bit shy, we might not be sure what you, what you mean, by what you are doing. Doing it in a glider, uh, K twenty one, it's going to be very shy wing rocks anyway. Anyway, but that's another thing. Um, fourth question. So that's the tail slide. Uh, so you've got a figure here. It's a pull to vertical canopy down tail slide, and then there are three of twos on the way down before pushing exit. And uh, as we discussed, the wind is an important component in this sort of things. And you've got the direction of the wind. So this is flown downwind. So the aircraft, you see it pulling a, a vertical. And remember, if it's a zero lift axis or center of gravity track in this case. And the canopy down tail slide is correct, as described on this uh, diagram. And past the pendulum, you've got the vertical line and the three of two are done as indicated and then the aircraft pushes um, to inverted so what downgrades are you going to apply on this as the diagram shows on the vertical up it's a zero lift axis so the aircraft is perfectly vertical if it's going slightly to the right it's because the wind is pushing it there's no problem with that. However, you've got a clear change of directions reaching the top of the line here. So you see the pilot has pulled a little bit to make sure he's going to go canopy down. So that's a cheat. And you've got to judge if it's uh, five, 10 degrees or so. And on the way down, he's sliding back on the same line before doing his pendulum in the correct direction. And then once established in his down line, again, you can see it doesn't, it's not shown at the beginning, but we assume it's a zero lift axis there. And he's doing his three of two about here. And then you've got a longer line clearly, and he's pushing. And if you see the, the, the diagram, it's showing that he's pushing a bit too much effectively to start with before leveling. So what are you going to downgrade in this case? marks um, worked out here is 5.5 so effectively what's what's wrong is the upline you've got the the your cheat uh, at the top and that's counted on the way up and it's counted on the way down as well so it's already two points gone the pendulum is correct but one of the thing is uh, the the line for the rolls remember the rolls must be in the middle of the line and in a tail slide you you measure that from the vertical established down after the pendulum so you can see it's about 
one third up here. So it could be uh, one or two points, depending on how the judges feel at the time. Uh, how, how you guess, some, judging by your finger, or how, how you measure it, you've got to, to estimate how many points you deduct. And then there's a wobble at the bottom again. There's a little uh, correction. The pilot pushed too hard and then realized and pulled a little bit to get back to level. So that would be a four, four and a half points deduction on this one. Another one here, that's a one and a quarter spin followed by a quarter roll in the same direction with a pull to 45 uh, line and push to exit. And what you see is something like that. The plane has a slight climb before the stall, uh, the spin is triggered. However, the spin is correct. But as you see on the diagram here, the aircraft pauses for some time on the 90 degree after his, after his quarter roll here. And as we discussed, when you've got the whoop, when you've got the wind pushing you and you are sideways in the box, you are going to be moving along like that, like Keith was describing with a, a, a plane doing a stall turn. And after this pause, the quarter roll is down, down the line. And then the aircraft pulls and the nice radius, which is important. And the 45 line is okay on his push erect. So what would you deduct on this? As a judge, well, you've got the first mistake, which is the, the slight climb before it stalls, which is bad. The fact that he pauses, um, the long pause is a problem. You start down, downgrading points because if you've got uh, several rotations like that, they are meant to be successive. And there's not going to be any pause in between. So the long pause is going to be one, two points at least deducted. And then the quarter roll at the bottom and then he pulls out correctly. So yeah, as we said, deductions on this one are going to be one for the, the bump at the top and at least two points on the way down. And the final one. So this is the sequence. And you see the first, uh, the first figure is a 270 degrees. So as we discussed, um, the pilot comes on the main axis and he's got to do a figure that is going to bring him cross box. The pilot decides which direction is going to come out. And that's a good way to correct for winds if the winds is, is cross box quite a lot. So in this case, there's a 270. And as you see on the diagram below, the pilot er elects to do it away from the judges and come towards the judges. Uh, the second figure here is a 360 degree turn cross box. And when it's cross box, like this, a key thing of figures is the directions in relation to the wind. So this one is meant to be a 360 into wind turn. And what you see is the pilot is doing a 360, but he's doing it the other way around. Now, you've got uh, Humpty with a quarter roll on the way up half loop and three quarters on the way down. So the aircraft is meant to go up to vertical, which we imagine happens here, is doing a quarter roll. And again, look carefully, the shape, the direction in relation to the wind, this uh, empty is supposed to go. And coming out again towards the judges, which appears correct here. And then you've got another 180 degrees going back to what we said just before until the final figure 270 to the right coming out into wind. Now, I mentioned the 360 here. How many points are you going to deduct in total on these? Or which is going to be scored zero? Because remember, if it's wrong direction, it's R zero. So effectively what happens is uh, you've got three odd zeros here because the 360 was in the wrong direction being into wind or flown downwind instead of into wind. And clearly the, the trajectory here went wrong because we don't see the quarters there. But as you see, the vertical was meant to be um, with a quarter roll and the half loop going into wind and the pilot did it the wrong way. He went, he's, he did his half loop downwind. Then he pulled out after the correct 
three quarters, or at least he came out in the right direction. But then he did his 180 degrees to the right instead of downwind, which would, should have been to the left. So that's another hard zero. But that brought him back in the correct direction. He did his 270 in the correct direction and came out into wind. So that scores whatever, however he flew his 270 degrees. So here you've got the case of the, the, cross, the cross box figures with the elements going in the wrong direction. It's immediately added, adds up zero, out zeros on three figures. So that's a typical example of things where things can go wrong. Maybe Nick wants to add anything to that? Um, no, uh, nicely done, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those places um, when you're flying a sequence where you can fly a figure that, that uh, in the figure is, is flown perfectly well, but for some other outside reason, a major reason, um, it's connected a major penalty on the way through. So uh, turns and um, humpties where there's a, a top line into or out of wind, and also um, N figures where the 45 degree bit in the middle of the N um, needs to be flown into wind or, or um, downwind. Those directions make a catastrophic difference to the marks that you can have. There you go. So, oh, sorry, if I can just add higher levels, I see it when pilots prepare their sequences from uh, free nodes or things like that. It's, it's important to consider what the wind may be and where the figure is going to take you in the box because you want to give yourself options. And sometimes pilots do it in a certain way. They start in the wrong place and they, they draw their sequence. There's no way out of it and they end up out of the box or messing it up. Thank you very much. Okay, Doug. Well, I hope that worked for you. Um, we've gone on for, for an hour and three quarters, which is um, a bit of a slog, but um, there's a lot there. You can download all of this except the answers to the tests from the BAA website. So go back through it. Um, the judging pages on the BAA web have been crumbs um, probably 20 years in development and they've stood the test of time. So um, use those as a basis. There's lots of good advice there. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at a competition. Um, but take away um, one thought, if you will, and that's that somewhere in the United Kingdom, for those of you who are going to fly British competitions, there's a very large bag with tens in it. And only you guys can make them smaller. <laughs> We'll do our best on the judging line. Um, you try and do the best in the air, please. <laughs>